Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. We are so excited that you've joined us. Today, author Stormy Omardian shares how she was set free from the pain of her past. Yes, and George and Margaret take us back to the arrest of their son and the unexpected aftermath they were forced to deal with. It's a powerful story that proves that sometimes doing the right thing can come at a cost and trusting God can make all the difference in the world. And, uh... Ms. Hartzorn, yes, talk about trusting God. Why should we, and what does that really mean? Well, you know, as I'm thinking about this story that's coming up today, <laughs> can I give you a real-life example? Sure. You know, I got some kids, and we had some troubled years, Brian. And there were situations where, I mean, as mom and dad, we your kids are adults, uh, essentially, and they're making choices that you do not approve of. And, you know, you can be good cop, bad cop, which I learned to play that. You know, where are I? I got to go rescue them. I got to find out what they're doing and, you know, fix this. And and it just gets exhausting mm. trying to do mm. all of that. And I know there's some people watching right now and are going, oh, I'm living that journey. This is where, for me, trusting God was, can I trust God with my kids? Like, is he going to go get them when mama, you know, let's go? And I found he proved faithful. Praise I God. could trust him with my kids, with our family, and but I had to let go. Yeah. And it's a good place to live from. Mm. Yeah. I've had to learn that with my mother and also with my dad and his right. passing and yeah. uh, things yeah. that I couldn't do in my own strength. And right. It was really one of those errors that I said, God, I need you every yeah. moment. Yes. You know, and if you have questions about God, apologist Dr. Andy Bannister shares some insight and provides some answers. But first, this is author Stormy O'Mardian's powerful story of finding freedom from a painful past. Powerful. It, it, was a, it was a terrifying childhood. My mother was mentally ill from the time when she was about 19. She really just got progressively worse as time went on. Her craziness, you know, of course, went untreated and undiagnosed. She was very abusive, verbally abusive and physically abusive. She would lock me in a closet. It was a closet under the stairway in this um, farmhouse but there was light under the bottom of the door. So that's the light I had, which wasn't much. Created me a lot of loneliness, anxiety, depression, sadness. I never knew quite why I was put there. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I did this and I'm going to the closet. It was never like that. I was just put in the closet when my dad wasn't there. Between three and five, I was in that closet whenever my dad was gone. I went to school without any preparation. I was put on a bus, sent 30 miles away to the school. I was terrified of the kids. They were loud and they were scary. And so it was a terrifying time. I was afraid to go to school and I was afraid to come home. When I got into junior high, I had such pain inside of me all the time, all, always hurting, always fearful. And I just couldn't deal with it anymore. I couldn't stand the pain and I just wanted to end it. I didn't want to wake up with the pain anymore. I had a, a suicide attempt at 14. My mother was, she had uh, sleeping pills and, and she had things like that and I thought I was taking that but she had filled them with other pills and God only knows what all I took. Ended up not dying of course but making myself really sick. Once I was in high school, it seemed like I was able to deal with the insecurities better. I still had that depression all the time. I always had to work through the depression every morning. Get up, try to get on top of my life so I could get to school and function always had that, that sadness, that depression, that fear, that anxiety, you know, that was always there, but I was better at covering it by that time. So I just started auditioning and, you know, this is without really any training at all. I mean, I'm just by the seat of my pants going, you know, to these things and, and getting um, the job. I loved to sing and loved to dance and, and loved to act, you know, loved it. And, but I knew, I was just afraid that they're gonna find out, you know, uh, that there was nothing behind this facade, you know? I was empty, just empty. As my mother proclaimed to be a Christian at one point, I didn't want anything to do with Christians, no, nothing. Got into uh, drugs and alcohol and, and um, occult practices and Eastern religions. These are things that were going around. And there was a girlfriend who worked with me in a lot of the TV shows, her name was Terry. And um, she was a Christian, but I did notice something, notice something different about her. You know, something really great. 
I didn't know what it was, but I, and I saw her family and I saw some of her friends and I thought, wow, there's just a great quality to them that I really like, but don't talk to me about this Christian thing. I kept sinking down and sinking down. And um, I was on a recording session with Terry. I'm planning my suicide again. I was going to plan, this time I'm gonna make it work. I am going to get the right pills and I am going to go to sleep and never wake up again because I can't stand the pain. I'm not going to live with the pain anymore. She said to me, she says, I can see you're not doing very well. She says, why don't you come with me to meet my pastor? I said, okay, okay, I'll go meet your pastor. I thought, well, at least I can do this for her, you know, before I put myself to death. He started talking to me about Jesus, not the way my mother talked about Jesus, but you know, in a new way, and that he would change me from the inside out. I thought, wow, that, that sounded so great. I mean, pretty, pretty far-fetched, you know, but worth a try. I mean, I tried everything else. So he said, I've got three books I want to give you. When you go home and read them this week, and then come back, let's meet, and you tell me what you think of those books. One of those books was the Gospel of John. I went home and read these books. Something in me changed. I knew I had read the truth. So I went back and met with him and um, received the Lord there. And I could feel a sense of hope, and that was the biggest thing. That sense of hope, wow, never forget that. I, I, I never had that before. But I still had the depression. Now here I am, I have a, an eternal future that is good. I have life with the Lord, I have life with Him here now. So I'm thinking, why am I so depressed? And the depression's got worse. I called the church and they um, put me with this um, pastor's wife, her name was Mary Ann. I told her everything. She said, well, I want you to fast and pray for three days. In, in the meantime, I want you to write down every sin that comes to mind. I did that, fast and prayed. I was afraid I was gonna die in the night without dinner, you know, because I'd gone to bed hungry too many times in my life. And so that was scary as can be. But I did it because I wanted what God had. I, I was willing to do whatever it was, took to get rid of those feelings. I came back to the office uh, to meet her in her office and, and she just had me lift that lift that list up to the Lord and just, you know, ask for forgiveness for it, you know. And um, then she had me confess my unforgiveness toward my mother, which I had. And then I had to confess and renounce my occult practices, which I had never done. When I did those three things, the Lord really spoke to me through that counselor saying, my daughter, you've been locked in a closet all your life, uh, first physically and then emotionally, but I have the keys. And you can walk through that door and be free. When they prayed, I could feel that depression lift. It's not something I conjured up in my mind because I had no idea that that could happen. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to feel a little good, you know, like, you know, you know, just feel better. That's what I was expecting. I was not expecting to be set free from it completely. That was a miracle to me. That changed my life. Being a Christian or a believer doesn't mean you don't go through things, but He is there with you. And that is such an important thing because we all go through stuff. No matter how dark that time is, you have a light in you that will not go out. Never forget that. Never, ever forget that. I was so moved to see Stormy's story because in a very dark season of my life, Stormy in many ways saved my life. I mean, to look back and think, here's now she's this powerful woman of God who has written many books on the power of prayer. And her book, The Power of Praying for Your Adult Children, it truly was our rescue. We, my husband and I would use that book. We didn't know what to ask for. We didn't know what to pray for. We took Stormy's book and we just prayed through those prayers for our kids. When we didn't have words, she gave us words. And I'm so thankful that that broken, scared little girl that was locked in that closet, that was raised in an abusive environment, that she actually found freedom and not just freedom, but now she lives this powerful life and is speaking freedom to others. As I watched her story, I thought, you know, there's such a good lesson here that, you know, in her brokenness, she had made agreements with the enemy and the enemy, he doesn't care who we are, even if we're a vulnerable child, he will try to gain access and have influence and oppress our lives. But we saw in Stormy's uh, story that she practiced confession and repentance. She renounced 
her involvement with the occult. She confessed and even got to that beautiful place of forgiveness towards her mom. You see, the practice of repentance shuts doors to the enemy. The enemy will try to gain access to you through trauma, through unconfessed sin, but you follow Stormy's example and just simply say, Lord Jesus, I confess and repent of my sin, the things that I have chosen to do and name them, and then say, I repent of any involvement with the occult and name it, and I confess any unforgiveness and name it, and I'll tell you, you can be set free. That's the power of repentance in Jesus' name, because Jesus is stronger than anything the enemy can throw at us. If you got some things to repent of so you can find freedom, Give us a call. We want to help you pray through that. 1-855-759-0700. Pick up one of Stormy's books too. They're great. Up next, George and Margaret lean on their faith to get them through unimaginable pain. In the summer of 1992, an arsonist began setting fires across Washington state. For six months, more than 120 buildings were destroyed, leading to three deaths and over $17 million in property damage. Authorities asked the public for help finding the arsonist. The Kellers remember it well. The first thing that captured my attention were the, the three pencil sketches. And I looked and I said, that looks like my son Paul, and my heart just stopped. Paul, you don't have a clue what you've done. As Christians, George and Margaret knew what they had to do. No loving father is going to want to even believe that his child is capable of crimes, much less something that is so horrendous. But this is the truth. The Lord gave me the strength at that moment to go and contact the arson task force, which I did. Paul was arrested, pled guilty, and was sentenced to 99 years in prison without parole. For George and Margaret, it became the beginning of a different kind of sentence. I would think giving up your son, which was real, would merit support instead of abandonment. But then the first person that left us was our pastor at that time. Everybody just walked away. And I still don't get that. For the next three years, George and Margaret plummeted into financial despair when their marketing business collapsed. All my business clients just went away and I began to just sink. We lost the home, we lost our savings, ending up on welfare, going through bankruptcy and devastation, all the while knowing that we did what was right. They also struggled emotionally. I felt like a dark depression just settling down, the kind that's debilitating. Depression, severe anxiety, post-traumatic stress, all those things were going on. I was just a wreck, because it was, it was hell. And I did ask the Lord many times to take me home. Please, Lord, I, this is enough. Take me. For a time, they got help through Christian counseling and prescription medication, but it wasn't enough. So the Kellers continued to pray and clung to their faith. In the middle of the darkness, my anchor of faith in the Lord Jesus held. I was being strengthened to just live another day and another day and another day. My prayer was, Lord, I don't know if you're going to bring me out of this or not. But if I am ever well from this, 
And you could ever use this to just help one person, then as much as I don't want to, I'm willing to stay. One morning, Margaret woke up feeling different. The depression's gone, the anxiety is gone, the feeling of being so traumatized is gone. All those conditions that I had had were replaced with total joy, and I had such a freedom. And it was a healing, it was a gift from the Lord. I reached a tipping point when I was able to look in the mirror and said, I'm not depressed anymore. And that was very significant to me. And since then, I have not experienced what I would call being a depressed person. Over time, they stabilized financially and also found community with people who welcomed them with open arms. Christian folks who I have met through the years who are more loving and tender than any family that I could ever know, standing with us in prayer all this way. Today, Paul continues to serve his sentence while George and Margaret run their own ministry and share their story of overcoming grief everywhere they go. I believe I love Jesus more through all this. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He did not lie. When you say, Jesus, here I am, it is enough. He loved you so much, he is going to bring you through. You know, when I look at George and Margaret, I said, oh my goodness, the amount of opposition they had to go through for doing the right thing. You know, um, that is probably one of the most painful things that any parent will have to face, that they would see their son uh, go to jail because of what he's done, and they would be the people that would have to turn him in. But I really believe that is the only option that we have, because if we cover it, we begin to conspire with it. I wonder if you're going through something like that with a child or maybe even a spouse. I want to give you uh, some hope today. It says in, in Hebrews 6.19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil. That's so powerful because this is the hope that we have in Jesus. And this is why it doesn't mean that just because things are happy clappy that we're we're Christian, but we're Christian because we believe in Christ and our faith is in him behind the veil. And he behind the veil is gonna get us through whatever we're going through. But sometimes it is a difficult road and we are grieving and living through the grief. I wanna get something into your hands, one 855 700 If you've gone through what George and Margaret has gone through and they said it was a depression, I wanna pray for you too, but I need you to call the number on the screen because we're here for you. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Hey, pray with me. Father, you know the situation, you know the pain, but I thank you, Lord. You also know the promise that they have and you'll bring them through to the end. And I join and blend faith together and ask you for your peace and your anchor to hold in Jesus' name, amen. Call us. Up next, Dr. Apologist Dr. Andy Bannister answers more tough questions about God. Hear what Dr. Chauncey Crandall, successful cardiologist and best-selling author, has to say about Pat Robertson's latest book, 10 Laws for Success. Greatness is available to each one of us, but we have to do it God's way. Pat Robertson in this book is giving you the secrets for that today. He's giving you the tools that you need based on the Word of God to achieve success, victory, and a happy life. One of the challenges I sometimes hear is why is the church responsible for so much violence? Look through history, look at the Crusades, look at religious wars, look at the Spanish Inquisition. Actually, sometimes the question goes deeper than that. Maybe the problem isn't so much the church, maybe it's religion in general. Shortly after I moved uh, to Toronto back in 2010, there was a debate uh, between Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister, and a gentleman called Christopher Hitchens, 
uh, no longer with us, but uh, then one of the leading new atheists, so-called new atheists in the world. And they debated over the question, is religion good for society? And in the middle of that debate, uh, Christopher Hitchens planted this very clever one-line uh, argument on Tony Blair. He said, the problem is religion poisons everything. He's, later, he's also repeated that claim in, uh, in one of his best-selling books. Religion poisons everything. Look at its track record. We'd be better off without it. How might we respond to Christopher if he was here in front of me? Well, here's the interesting thing. It's long struck me that you could remove the word religion from that phrase, religion poisons everything. And you could replace it with other words, couldn't you? Politics poisons everything. Politics is responsible for war and uh, violence and all kinds of problems. What about money? Money poisons everything. Money is responsible for crime. Money is responsible for jealousy. What about sex? Sex poisons everything. It's responsible for sexual violence and rape and all kinds of things. In other words, the issue doesn't seem to be religion per se. The issue seems to be something rather bigger than that. I increasingly think the problem is not with religion, science, politics, or sex, or anything out there. The problem is closer to home. The problem actually lies in here. The human heart, as human beings, we seem to have this ability to pick up things and use them for a great good or great evil. The Russian novelist Alexander Solzhenitsyn once wrote these words. He said, the dividing line between good and evil runs not between states or ideologies or philosophies, but the dividing line between good and evil runs right through the middle of every human heart. In other words, he's saying, the problem is not out there somewhere, the problem is in here somewhere. And if we're gonna solve the problem of violence and injustice and suffering in the world, what we need is not to throw the blame around that religion or science or politics, we need something to actually transform the human heart. And I know only one thing that can do that, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. A very famous Victorian uh, preacher back at the, uh, the late 1800s was once challenged by one of the leading atheists of the day to a debate on the truth of Christianity versus atheism. His response was interesting. He wrote back to the atheists and said, I'm very happy to have the debate, but I will bring with me to the, to the debate um, 20 people whose lives have been transformed by Christianity, former drunks, former prostitutes, former criminals. Would you, for, for, by way of balance, bring with you to the debate 20 people whose lives have been transformed and turned around by atheism? Lo and behold, no debate took place. But to return to the original question, that all that aside, haven't there been times that the church has behaved badly? Yes, I think we can put our hand up and go, sometimes that sadly has been true, but of course, One's response to that depends on what you think the church is designed to be. You see, the church is not, I believe, designed to be a museum for saints. It's designed to be a hospital for sinners, a place where people who are broken and whose lives are being put back together by Christ can be drawn together and united in community. And that means sometimes the church will go wrong. But when someone who's claiming to be following Jesus Christ engages in violence, or, uh, or evil, of course you can hold them to a standard. You can look at them and you say, you claim to be following Jesus, but you're living like this, what's going on? The question I ask to my atheist friends is, by what standard can I judge your life? By what standard can I hold an atheist to when he or she goes wrong? Sometimes I put the question this way. Take one of the most violent atheists in history, Joseph Stalin, the uh, Russian communist leader, under whose atheistic regime hundreds of millions of people were killed. I say to my atheist friends, if you had a time machine, Imagine that you had such a thing, and you could go back in history, and you could stand in his bedroom like by his deathbed as Stalin was breathing his last words. What would you say to him to convince him as an atheist that the way he'd lived his life was wrong? What could you say? And the answer is nothing at all. Nothing at all. When someone claims to be following Jesus, they are, if they truly are following him, they're engaged in a process of transformation, and there is a standard to which you can hold them. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. So many things in this show I can relate to, Brian. I mean, Stormy O'Mardian was and is still like a mentor to me. Mm. 
Um, she really taught me to persevere in my faith, yeah. you know, through the power of prayer. And and the story that you shared, you know, mm. from that family and you, sometimes you gotta make tough decisions in yeah. your family life. Yeah, you know? that's tough love, but it's necessary in yeah. order to see really that, that uh, the break between uh, the trauma oh. that the enemy of our soul, the yeah. accuser, tries to bring. Oh, yeah. And it's hardest when we're uh, dealing with our children. Yes. And when it you know is. that, but you've got to, yes. you've got to get a hold of it. That is, and, it, and, and just know that if you're there and yeah. you're making tough choices, that God does sustain you. He does. He will give you everything you need. And a lot of it is a test of our faith. Our, is your faith genuine? I tell you, you can go through the fire with genuine faith, you know? Amen. Pat Robertson talks a lot about that, doesn't he, Brian? About he does. just the genuineness of our faith. It's a persevering faith. Scripture talks about faith and actually all the way to the book of Revelation that our faith would persevere. That's one of the prayers that we pray. It is. So become a partner with us. Become a persevering partner with us. Pray with us. Stand with us. Give to us. We need your financial support. Yes. Whether it's, you know, $20 a month or more, you can become a 700 Club Canada partner. And yeah. as our thank you, we'd love to get into your hands and it's called the 10 Laws of Success. Yeah. And this is a proven tool that will help you absolutely navigate those tough waters. It would be such an encouragement if you call now 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by, and we are grateful Thank for you. that. You know, uh, as we've been praying, I've sensed that there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of challenges as well. Would you put Diva on your prayer list? She's praying for guidance in her relationships. And Mary's asking for direction and favor in her work as her job has been eliminated. Uh, it's a tough journey. Let me cover both of those. Sure. Father, for Diva and Mary, I believe that your word is, again, hope is an anchor for the soul. Yeah. It goes behind the veil. And for those that are even now experiencing struggle, mm -hmm. Lord, we come in and pray for your peace. Mm -hmm. And we agree that the best is yet to come. Yes. In Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name. Persevere, trust God. He will give you everything you need. Thanks for watching today. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. The article was about a man who had built a depository for disabled babies. And my immediate reaction was, why does this exist? You know, what does it say about me? What does it say about you? What does it say about all of us? And it was kind of haunting to me. You know, a box for babies.